Okay. Hello, everyone. We are here with Edser Pebesma from the R Special Community. <laughs> and I give you the floor, Edser. You are in charge of the R Special panel. So it will be one hour and a half of R Special. Enjoy, people. <laughs> Thank you so much, Fero, for uh, introducing me. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm here. I'm not uh, alone, as you can see. I'm here with Paula Moraga, Roger Biven, Dewey Dennington, and Lorena Abad um, to uh, to bring to you this uh, our special panel. And this is sort of a combined thing of uh, first a couple of short presentations on on different topics and from different angles to our space, what our spatial is and does. And then um, then we have that is basically meant to cover. The first 45 minutes, and then we have 45 minutes to uh, for an basically for an open discussion. And so the the program uh, the program as you find it uh, on this session has a couple of you know a couple of example questions that we could could look at. But please, if you want to discuss them, please submit them to the question uh, panel because we are looking for your feedback and and, and get in touch with all of you. So I have a couple of slides to uh, introduce. Oh, this is a, a lot of text. So R has a, a long history, you know, from started in sort of 97, version one was in, in 2000, um, but it built on decades long history of S plus development. So a, a sort of a, a common thinking about, uh, about statistical problems. The initial design goal, there was an environment for interactive work, interactively working with data uh, and statistical models. People were using Fortran routines and so on, and wanted to kind of get some interaction with uh, with models. Uh, today, essentially, people use or abuse use use R for everything, um, and and you could say that the search in data collection and data science has led to a strong increase in use of R. Um, R and S plus have always been used for analyzing spatial data, so there's long history also in S plus already were with working with maps and and showing statistical data in maps using using S plus and later R. Um, and our spatial, the community that we're now uh, having, basically seeing, uh, really took off after Roger Bivent organized the workshop in 2003, uh, where he also invited a couple of uh, later always Geo people. Always Geo didn't exist in that time, I think, uh, including Marcus Nadler, for instance, was there, if I recall correctly. Um, and um, there we basically agreed that um, if you would, you know, share a, a, a set of common classes that would that, that would really help package developers. Uh, to work with spatial data and, and after doing that uh, basically we did that in sp spotstat is an older package that has also a set of, of class defined classes then came raster classes now we have a couple of packages sf stars terra net sf networks and so on that uh, that form a basis for using uh, follow-up uh, work uh the the, the, the three key library uh, key libraries in in osgeo the gdal project and geos have been used since since early times and uh, one of the sort of uh, interesting things about R, if you're not so familiar with it, is that we have an, an install packages that just works, basically. You know, you don't have to worry about things. But that means that for, for Mac and Windows, we essentially create and distribute binary packages and that these binary packages co contain complete copies of these uh, libraries. So you then suddenly have a package that's 100 megabytes and contains a complete GDAL with all the dependent libraries uh, with it. Um, there is one package, simple features that we, I've been working on a lot the last couple of years. You can see here a number of the downloads. So this, I don't know what these numbers mean. You know, they go up and down like like bitcoins, but um, there are there are it's being used. And, and and people that download SF, download GDL, Geos Proj, and, and a couple other things, um, usually without them knowing. This is a a, a word cloud and an, and an, and a graph that that Roger prepared that basically explains an, a number of packages and how much they are being reused by other R packages in the in the in sort of in the cron package network right so you see here that sp and raster to all those have strong have, have most reverse dependencies and then comes sf and so on and a couple of other ones and there are now three rgdal rgs and map tools that are going to uh, retire now since that roger uh, retired and that we have to really look for um, for finding solutions, because so many other packages depend on our GDA, our GEOS, or map tools, and have to look for uh, different solutions to do what they uh, what they did. 
Um, we have applied for becoming an, uh, an OSDO community project uh, recently, uh, also with help from um, Robin Loveless for, for, for getting this started uh, and going. And um, the problem is not so much that we don't have a home for packages because we have Crown, right? Our community manages everything itself or to convince some, someone that we are a, a functioning user and developer community because that is that is clear. What we want to do is raise awareness for our users that they use OSDO software when they're using our spatial packages because it, is, it goes so automatically that they, they don't easily see those things. Um, and also some OSDO users may not be aware that there is an R or R spatial, although R and R spatial packages have been included in OSDO Live for a long time. Um, and, and those might benefit from that. So we hope for more people to, uh, that they will become active in, uh, in both projects and we really look for more communications and also we hope for contributions to upstream OSTO libraries and potentially also from funding for, for funding to, to get this to, to get this going, for instance, from the R construction. Um, and uh, we hope to use the second half of this panel discussion to, to discuss your questions. So um, I'm looking forward to your questions. So really, please do uh, share them. Um, I will now introduce the, uh, the second speaker um, of this um, of this session, and that is um, hang on, I'm looking, I'm, I'm getting lost. Oh, I, I wrote it on my paper. That is the second speaker of today. Is Paula this morning is Paula Moraga. Uh, Paula is an wow. assistant professor of statistics of King Abdul University of Science and Technology, uh, and is the PI of the Geo Health Group. Her research focuses on statistical methods for geospatial data analysis and health surveillance. So, Paula, go ahead. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, well, uh, I'm Paula Moraga, and I'm an assistant professor of statistics at CAUST. My work focuses on the development of statistical methods and computational tools for geospatial data analysis and health surveillance. And I'm the author of the book, Geospatial Health Data, Modeling and Visualization with Arilla and Shiny. So today I'm going to, to give an overview of the R ecosystem, and then I will talk about R spatial applications. R is a free open source software environment for statistical computing and graphics that has many excellent packages for importing and manipulating data, modeling and visualization. We can download R from CRAN, the Comprehensive R Archive Network, and then we can use it uh, using R Studio, that is an integrated development environment. So here we have a screenshot of R Studio. Here we have a, a pane where we can write code, and then we, we execute the code in the console, uh, and we can see also the output of the code. Then we have other panes with the history of the instructions that we are executing and also the plots that we create. R has a lot of functionality for reading and writing data, for creating vectors, matrices and other objects, for statistics, programming and for visualization. In addition, if we need additional functionality, we can install other R packages for retrieval, data retrieval, manipulation, analysis, visualization, reporting. So to install a package, we need to write install packages and the name of the package, and then to use it, library and the name of the package. For example, we can install packages from the tidyverse that is a collection of R packages for data science, or we can install the SF package for working with spatial data, or many other packages for downloading and um, visualizing spatial data, such as administrative boundaries, population, open street map data, environmental information, health information, and so on. A package that is widely used for plotting is ggplot2, and here I have the code that is needed to create this, this map, but these packages can also be used to create other types of plots. With R, we can also create interactive visualizations 
Uh, and these are done with uh, HTML widgets that are wrappers of JavaScript code. For example, here we have um, time series plots, interactive tables where we can sort columns or search specific words. We can also create leaflet maps uh, to represent the spatial information. And these packages are, are very easy to use with just a, a few lines of, of code. We can also create reproducible documents with R Markdown. So here we have an example. An R Markdown document is a document where we have text uh, with Markdown syntax, and then we have R code within R chunks. And then when we execute this file, we get a, a document where the output of the R code is shown. And here uh, in the header, we specify that we wanted an HTML document, but we can also get uh, PDFs or, or Word documents. We can also create interactive dashboards with Flex Dashboard or interactive web applications with Shiny. And this allows us to publish a group of related data visualizations that the user can interact with. For example, here we have a, a dashboard that shows air pollution globally, and the user can filter uh, the countries uh, to show the countries with the air pollution levels within a range. So this is from the point of view of a user, but we can also develop our own packages. And if we do that, we may consider submitting our package to our open site that is an initiative with the mission to foster a culture that values open and reproducible research. Our OpenSci has a lot of different packages uh, for computing infrastructure, data access, visualization, statistics, and so on. And the way that it works is that um, the developer submits the package and then is peer reviewed to ensure the quality and, and robustness of the package. We can also write a manuscript explaining uh, how our package works and submit it to the R journal. And for learning R, we have a lot of resources. We have books, videos, cheat sheets, blogs. And the good thing is that many of these resources are freely available online. We can also join an R community, for example, R forwards and R ladies, R groups to promote diversity in the R community. And by joining these communities, we will be able to interact with other R users, learn new skills, learn about uh, workshops or job opportunities in a very friendly and supportive environment. There are conferences, for example, the USR conference is, is held every year. And we also have other conferences, for example, Connect AR is a, is a meeting for our users in, in, Latin, in Latin America. And if you're in Twitter, you can follow many interesting accounts of individuals and organizations that use R. And the hashtags are RStats for R, and specifically for spatial, it is RSpatial. So R Special has many applications in a wide range of disciplines, such as environment, health, agriculture, climate, ecology, economy, society. And this analysis can help governments, companies, and citizens improve decision making. So here I have a few examples. Like these are examples drawn from the book by Ken Steve, Public Policy Analytics. Here you have the link. And these are um, examples of um, analysis of burglaries in Chicago. This is um, about transport planning uh, by Robin Lovelace et al. And this is a tool uh, for propensity to cycle in England that can help uh, decision makers. And we also have packages for health surveillance, for example, a special API for disease mapping and detection of clusters or epiflows for risk assessment of travel-related spread of disease, and, and there are many other applications. 
So before finishing, um, like I, as I said before, I'm working in KAUST and KAUST has very good fellowships. If so, if you want to study a master's or, or a PhD at KAUST, you have here some information. And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Paola. Um, so we are going directly to the second speaker and we'll uh, sort of, if you have questions, uh, for Paula or anyone, then please uh, write them up in the uh, in the question tab. We have plenty of time to come back to that. So we will continue now with a 10-minute presentation from Roger Bivent. Roger is a professor of the Norwegian School of Economics. He specialize, his specialties are geographical information analysis, statistical programming, and spatial econometrics. And Roger is author of numerous R packages, including RGDAL, SP, Map Tools, RGRA7, is the main author of the Applied Spatial Data Analysis with R book. Roger, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. It's nice to be with you. Uh, what I'd like to do is to go behind the scenes. Paul has given you a picture of what it looks like from the, from the um, uh, front. So I'm now going to go behind and look at the links between uh, OSGO, PhosphorG and R, which have existed over, over a long time. As Edsa mentioned, some of the participants in the meeting in Vienna 18 years ago uh, have uh, uh, played a, uh, a major role in developing uh, the OSGO movement. Uh, I myself was present in Lausanne in 2006, so that some of this is, is, uh, um, is sort of familiar territory. I'm going to speak for uh, a very short, short while on R itself, but particularly focusing on the package man management system, which um, I believe is um, one of the reasons why the OSGO approach to doing things and the R approach to doing things uh, diverge in some ways. Uh, R is a free software environment. And the stress is on environment, which includes both the people and the software. Um, the packages add functionality to R so that R itself is quite quite small, uh, but the number of packages and the things that the packages can do extend its role uh, enormously. This uh, has a strong impact on the way in which R and the R, uh, comprehensive R archive network, they don't just distribute the packages, but they use them very, very uh, uh, actively checking 18,000 uh, CRAN packages daily across multiple platforms, both checking to see whether developments in R itself, changes in the development version of R have broken any packages or whether changes in any of the packages have broken other packages. So that there's more or less continuous real-time checking of the packages against each other and against R itself. Uh, uh, one of the areas which has seen substantial work in the in the last uh, six months has been the introduction of uh, Apple Silicon. And we this is now running so that we now have full Apple Silicon uh, provision uh, for ARM64. And what will be coming probably at the next uh, uh, release of ARM before two, probably in April uh, 2022, will be shifting windows from one or other of the uh, C runtimes to the universal C runtime, which provides Windows native support for um, UTF-8 uh, multibyte characters. Uh, those are the character sets which are typically used on smartphones, are used on Mac OS, they're used on, on, on Linux, and Windows has been the, 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 the one left out. So that we hope uh, next year to be doing that. And all of this involves an, uh, an enormous amount of churn in the package management system. It's very highly integrated so that any change which is made in R itself has impacts on the, the, um, the package management system. Uh, it was mentioned by, by Edsa that uh, binary packages are provided for Mac OS and Windows. Binary packages mean both that the R code itself is byte compiled and that an, any C code which is used is also um, uh, compiled static so that for those binary packages, everything uh, is provided in what you download and install uh, from the archive network. Uh, 
binary packages are provided for, for, for the Mac OS and Windows for a number of reasons, one of which is in reducing install times. And another is to work around security hurdles, such that as, as has been seen very recently, that in order to get uh, the R package, which is called R Java, to link to the Java dialib on Mac OS, then it has to be, uh, I, I, I think that the term is notarized and signed so that we're trying to get around having to notarize and sign any dynamic libraries we might need to, to distribute by reducing their number. Uh, this means that the static built packages include compiled code for those platforms. This includes all of the external libraries, which need to be easy to build as clean static libraries. And this perhaps answers a question which has already come up about uh, OSGO for Windows, which is based on dynamic linking rather than static linking in most cases. Uh, Brian Ripley, who's one of the people who's been taking most care of this, uh, says that, um, or his statement, a clear statement is that static, link, link, static linking should ensure that distributions are complete, which means that when you download and install a, a binary package, it is complete and will work to specification. This is the way in which the R package management system tries to stabilize the software environment rather than using containers or environments or conda or similar uh, similar structures. Uh, reproducibility is also very important. So that one of the areas which we've seen where uh, the uh, approach taken in OSGO projects has differed somewhat from our is that uh, we really do need explicit and consistent verse version and dependency declaration in order to be able to explain uh, or to account for changes which have occurred. Even things as trivial as setting locales can be important to see where changes are coming from. If you think of sorting order, then sorting order changes depending on the locale uh, that you're looking at. Now, these are the uh, these are the uh, links that the uh, SF package, which Edsa men mentioned, have. And what I'm going to be looking at is below the line. Below the line are, in particular, the uh, Google. I call it Google because that was the way Frank Warmerdam pronounced it in Lausanne, explaining that Google is the almost uh, the geographical object-oriented data uh, abstraction library. But the object-oriented only got halfway there, so that you, you lose the two O's, Proj and Geos. Uh, Proj is really important and has been used uh, in our spatial to define coordinate reference system since, since the very beginning. Uh, Geos was first introduced into an R package 10 years ago, but its use has increased an awful lot since then. Uh, the uh, Google bindings were first created as an R package 20 years ago, uh, initially just for raster data, but have been extended to vector data very quickly by 2005 by Barry Rawlings. This then means that our packages for spatial data, the ones which interface uh, Proj, Geos, and Google, uh, uh, tend to be updated fairly fast, and particularly since the Google barn raising occurred three years ago, started two to three years ago. And for this, we've had to be very nimble, been watching very carefully, monitoring the uh, development email lists, Proj, Geos, Devel, Gal, uh, Google, Dev, Grass, User, Grass, Dev, and grass stats. My initial position was uh, was interfacing the grass GIS. That was where I came in and got involved in other things. Now, what, what happens when the uh, OSGO upstream libraries that we use change? So some first steps. We need to use the development email lists of those libraries to watch what is going on. So for instance, just yesterday, uh, Greg Texel on GeosDevil, uh, with reference to the forthcoming uh, 310 release of, of uh, Geos. He says, what really hurts in packaging is needing to synchronize things. The upcoming postures release needs to work with a, a bunch of, of um, PostgreSQL versions because not everybody is running the, the most recent one. And it should work with all of the Geos versions released a year or so ago or, or more recently. I'd argue that this is being optimistic. In fact, if you look at CentOS, CentOS is five, six, seven years ago. And we, we need to provide facilities for our spatial packages to run both on 
the archaeological, the, the antique operating systems like CentOS or, 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 or older Debian or Ubuntu, but still in 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 uh, in haven't have not not yet having reached their end of life. So we have to do this partly by uh, by by working hard, trying to make sure that we're, we're handling things and uh, uh, making issues tickets to indicate uh, how we need to control the changes which are occurring in in um, in the upstream libraries. So, that, for instance, the, these these are some of the issues which I've raised on 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 Proj. Uh, sometimes these issues. Sometimes the, the issues that we raise uh, are echoed by other packages, and in over time things have 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 improved so that version declarations are now much more stable. Uh, we need to that's on the R spatial side. We need to install betas and release candidate libraries, uh, running R command check on the maintain pack the packages we maintain ourselves, and adapting early if we need to do this. So I checked with the SF source code. Uh, and there are 58 uh, if uh, choosing sort of forking on different versions of Proj, Geos, and Google. Uh, that's quite a lot for 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 one one, one set of one 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 set of, uh, of of source files. Once the R package is interfacing the uh, external library, the new versions of the external libraries have been have been adapted. We then need to do the reverse dependency checks. And the reverse dependency checks for R spatial now mean checking about a thousand packages. Uh, for me, it on using five cores, it takes me about five hours. So it's about uh, 25 hours for uh, the whole the whole set, but, but five cores helps. So that there's quite a lot of work trying to catch things and the kind of things that we catch when this happens are uh, one which we caught uh, very recently so this is three weeks ago which turned out that between proj 721 which was present on one computer and proj uh, 811 which was present on another a small change was made to how you treat a declaration of just plus proj equals utm but no zone given up until proj 811 and it was backported this led to the creation of, a, of an illegal zero zone, which doesn't exist, with a, a, a longitude of minus 183, which should never have been there. So a bug fix in Proj led to downstream packages from our packages running into trouble. So this is this is the kind of thing, thing that we do. Another one, uh, uh, you can see that we're busy at Christmas as well, not with not so much with family things, although I have six grandchildren. Uh, Christmas last year ended up uh, Monday the 28th, um, writing to the, the, the Proj email list to pull out a particular problem with regard to a regression for the Obtran, uh, the, the Obtran projection, which then got fixed. So it was partly in Proj itself and partly in 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 the code in in our Google, but it got fixed. Uh, another one which has uh, occurred very recently is that different binary installs may install versions of the ProjDB database, and if they are out of sync, that's the one in an R package and the one in some other, in this case, Grass, are different versions. Then the specifications of the database also differ. So. So in this case, the, there was there was uh, the R package was running uh, ten point zero eight, Grass was running nine point uh, nine point eight point six, and those two have a different uh, di different schematic uh, feel. Uh, we also saw an issue on the SF list recently, which was caused by the Windows version, the Windows. CRAN binary SF package using GEOS 390 when three, GEOS 390 had a particular bug which was relieved in GEOS 391. So that what we needed then to do very quickly was to rebuild uh, the SF package with an updated version of the GEOS package. These kinds of things happen a lot. Now, in summary, 
Without the OSGO libraries and the active and generally generous participation of the developers, there would be simply no R spatial. I mean, you could see from the quotation, if the letters were, were large enough to, to let you see them, that, that engaging with the developers on the proj list meant that I, uh, I was uh, in direct contact with key developers who were able to, to, to illuminate the problem. And their generous participation, sharing their time has been very useful. On the other hand, we also feed back, um, not bug reports, but re re reports of things which we didn't expect to see, some of which turn out to be our misunderstandings, but also uh, may uh, help the developers so that being very active on trying uh, betas and release candidates mean that we're being part of a, a larger community. Some of the points we make are quite different, uh, quite similar to those of other uh, other packages. We're also interested going forward in collaborating in efforts to clean up and test the package config, the configure AC and CMake uh, of the upstream libraries, especially for static builds, which will make it much easier for the people on the R side who do the building of the packages uh, and they're all volunteers uh, to, to, to fix this. So we've also got plenty of experience of, of Windows Universal uh, C runtime now. And we also have issues we can raise with regard to, to cross compilation, uh, some of which we, we can feed feedback. But um, at that point, I'll stop and leave the rest for, for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roger. That was a little bit longer than 10 minutes, but anyway, you want to summarize 25 years of history. So that was uh, that was useful and a lot of technical uh, things. Um, so any questions should go into the question tab as uh, as mentioned before. Our next speaker is Dewey Dunnington. Dewey is, um, um, is an environmental researcher, programmer and educator based in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Dewey's research investigates the mechanisms that control metal cycling in lakes alongside geospatial applications to environmental research. He is currently a physical scientist at Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Go ahead, Dewey. Uh, thanks. I'm sure that's, hold on, let me just get that. Uh, Edric, can you just let me know that my uh, screen is sharing properly? Sure. Uh, and perhaps I can't hear you. Uh, let's see. I'm sharing my time screen. It should be should be going. Uh, so let me know if this isn't working. But uh, Roger did a great job of summarizing uh, a, a lot of history, and I'm certainly grateful for uh, Roger's uh, bug reports and his packages. And I've read a lot of uh, Roger's code, and uh, it has been it's it's honor it's an honor to be uh, alongside Edzer and, and Roger and all the other panelists. Um, I just wanted to talk about something that recently I did uh, in the last couple of years which is trying to connect R and, and, and QGIS or, or QGIS. These are a lot of things that I see on the screen and that I don't get to talk aloud about very often. Um, so I hope that I'm not uh, uh, mispronouncing anyone or anything. Uh, I certainly didn't, GDAL was pronounced Google until today. Anyway, so uh, this all came about because I saw a tweet um, from Niall, Niall Dawson. And I, I just saw this, this pull request come through in uh, GitHub and. He's like, oh, this, there's now a standalone console tool for running a processing algorithm. And I'd done a whole lot of working with uh, QGIS or QGIS um, previously. And it, it really struck me that like this is this is the answer. This is how we get our uh, to, to connect to this. Um, and of course, uh, Yana's uh, had made a package that did this already. Um, but with the re a release of uh, QGIS 3, um, it had stopped working or been harder to get to work on all platforms. So this works on Windows, uh, which is key for R, as Roger mentioned, like getting it to work on Windows is is, is a challenge sometimes. Um, but it's really essential uh, because a lot of people are stuck at work uh, using this or uh, are, are stuck using it just because they like it. Um, and so having to work on Windows is a big deal. So I saw this and I was like, oh, this is this is how we can do this. Um, and I was, I'm really grateful for uh, Robin and Giannis for, for really roping me into. Uh, I just did the proof of concept, and and uh, and they saw it and said, "Oh, this 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 could really work." And they put a lot into this package as well. Um, and yeah, it, it all comes from the fact that you can now call QGIS underscore process from the command line. Uh, and as you can see, the usage is here. Uh, you have a flag to to spit out JSON if you want to. It's easier to parse on the on the tail end. Um, and 
you can do something, you can run an algorithm or, or, or show the help for a command. And then you just type in the algorithm ID and then you put in some parameters. Um, and I was like, oh, this sounds pretty simple. Like most of the parameters that we're uh, typing in are, you know, some number. And so that, that, that should be no problem. Uh, as you'll see, it, it was uh, uh, somewhat of a problem uh, in the end. So if you're just using this, uh, this is uh, where you can install this from. You can uh, uh, grab this from uh, the GitHub repository and install it directly. Uh, we do have plans to release it to uh, CRAN or CRAN, depending on who you talk to. Um, and uh, we're working on a couple of things, perhaps some upstream contributions to, to QGIS and uh, perhaps some improvements to the QGIS process package to make that be a reality. Um, and one thing that I wanted to uh, uh, to highlight is that it, it, you know, it has to connect somehow. And this is actually one of the hardest parts of the entire package is correctly detecting a QGIS process installation on like everybody's computer. Um, it's not trivial to do, but we were really fortunate to have uh, a lot of uh, QGIS users in a lot of countries, which is important uh, because a lot like the here in Canada and, and in the US, uh, we have pretty standard uh, names uh, or standard characters that are within the ASCII set. Uh, but very often, uh, once you get into uh, any other country in the world, you're dealing with uh, multi-byte characters and you're dealing with, uh, you know, exante goose. And that actually uh, is, is difficult to deal with uh, well. And we're really lucky that it seems to work very well, or at least nobody has reported an install problem uh, for quite a while. Um, and one of the key things that I wanted to do is, is make this really easy, seamless integration with, with the existing R spatial ecosystem. Um, and so, uh, at, at this time, that for what I was doing, that meant supporting SF, and it meant supporting uh, uh, the raster package, and it meant supporting the stars package. There are certainly more, and we're, we plan to add some more in there. Um, but we really wanted to be able to, to pass these objects through to QGIS uh, in exactly the same way that you would pass a file name normally, because um, we wanted to make it be a, a really seamless, uh, uh, yeah, a seamless way to run those algorithms. And so this is the 99% nor the of what people are doing uh, with this package is just calling QGIS run algorithm and the name of the algorithm. And then there are some named uh, parameters. Uh, and that behind the scenes, uh, it, it'll print out the command that it runs on the, uh, the command line. Uh, there's a lot of temporary files involved with the, uh, with the seamless integration with our objects. Um, and then it will print out what happened status and it'll give you this result um, and more importantly it will parse that result into something that you can uh, work with uh, programmatically um, and in particular uh, this is the as concise as I could think to make it um, and it seems to be working for people uh, I'm just calling stssf on the results um, and it, usually there's an obvious output uh, argument and uh, yeah and it, it'll give you that this, this buffer uh, using QGIS, which uh, is magical to me and, and very useful for all the work that I do uh, in environmental research. Um, there's a lot of algorithms out there uh, from Grass and Saga, and interfacing those through R can be pretty difficult, particularly if you're on Windows. Um, so it's uh, totally magical to me to be able to access this stuff. Uh, and I'm, I'm so grateful that the QGIS process uh, command line utility uh, enables that to work. Uh, if you're wondering what algorithms are uh, supported, uh, oops, let's, yeah, so here we go. Uh, you can have access to almost all of them. And I, I gather there, there are some complexities with uh, loading some of these things on the command line. Uh, but for the most part, you have access to pretty much anything that you have uh, in the toolbox in QGIS. And, uh, and that is often how I find these things. And uh, usually I, I run them one time in Q, QGIS first, and then I uh, port that uh, to my R code. If you need help uh, and you're not don't have that QGIS window open, uh, or you don't have uh, a user interface installed or a, like a window system involved, uh, if you're on a CI or something, you can also show that help and it will print it out uh, for you and and uh, let you know all of the arguments and outputs. There's some challenges with here. Uh, not all of the input types are possible to serialize to a string yet, um, and I'm I'm really fortunate to be working with uh, uh, Flores and, and Niall Dawson. To, to try and um, make sure that, that all those uh, types of inputs can be uh, serialized properly. 
and so that we have access to all the algorithms, not just a subset for which we can uh, pass the arguments. And also we're running into a bit of a problem where uh, when you uh, run uh, the QGIS process command line tool, uh, it takes a couple of seconds. And that doesn't seem like a huge problem, but if you're if you're looping over or if you're trying to do a number of uh, different analyses, um, that can add up. And uh, we do we have some tricks to minimize that in the package, but uh, but eventually we're we're going to have to uh, perhaps find some way to make that uh, run a bit quicker. Um, and there's also some really cool things that other people have done with this, and I just wanted to highlight one of them that one of the contributors Jan uh, 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 contributed. And he wrote this package, he just called it QGIS, which is a great uh, name for what it does. And he just took all of those uh, uh, names and uh, made them into functions. And he does it all automatically and, and builds it up automatically. And you can call them just like our functions and it basically does the same thing. Um, but you get some really cool stuff like the help uh, files. And uh, I think that that is uh, totally wild and very cool. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see uh, see where that goes when we get uh, QGIS process on, on CRAN. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to make sure that I acknowledge Niall Dawson, who uh, submitted that initial pull request and has been maintaining that command line tool and has been so helpful uh, in person and on GitHub for us when we try and use it. We're the worst of the corner cases, and he's done a great job uh, supporting us. Um, I'm also uh, really grateful for all of the QGIS process collaborators. And I'm going to butcher all of their names, and I'm very sorry about that. But I wanted to acknowledge them anyway, and I hope that that is, is OK. Uh, Jan Kaha, Robin Loveless, uh, Yana Zmuchow, uh, Lorena, who uh, will be speaking in a bit, uh, Flores, uh, Anthony, and, and Gabo, all have submitted pull requests, and it, uh, it's been incredibly helpful. And finally, I want to acknowledge the people that paid me while I worked on a lot of this. Uh, I'm so grateful for the, the support of Fisheries Notions Canada um, and their contributions to free and open source software. Uh, they use all the stuff every day, um, and they're uh, very uh, generous with their employee time. Uh, letting them contribute to open source software. So I'll leave it there. You, uh, you can put any questions in the chat, and I'd be happy to to take a look at them afterward. Thank you, Dewey. That was a great presentation. An interesting, another sort of new, different angle on on our spatial and OSTO uh, connection. Um, so the next speaker we have. So we will address questions in the in the forty five minutes that we have left after the after our last speaker, who I'm now going to introduce. So last but not least, we have Lorena Abad. Lorena is a data scientist and researcher at the University of Salzburg with the Risk, Hazards, and Climate Lab. Her research focuses on spatiotemporal analysis of Earth observation data for mapping and monitoring natural hazards and landscape dynamics. She contributes to our packages for spatial analysis. So Lorena, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, we'll just share my screen, and I hope that's not really disrupting and that you can see it all. Um, so thank you, Edsor, for the introduction and thank you for having me in this panel. I am really we, honored. I, I don't think we see your screen, uh, Lorena, yet. Oh, that is a pity. Uh -huh. Is this better? Uh, maybe I'm the only one who didn't see it. Yeah, no, it's, no, it's good, yes. Oh, it's good, okay. Great. Yeah. Great. Thank you for letting me know. Um, so as I was saying, <laughs> I'm really honored uh, to be in this panel. Actually, a lot of the people that I'm going to talk with today, I've only known from um, GitHub issues, perhaps, and um, some Twitter discussions, and just watching other panels, except for Edser, who was my professor at the master's and also um, my thesis supervisor. Um, so yeah, I'm going to. Um, give a brief introduction of myself. As Edsar said, I'm uh, Lorena, I work at the University of Salzburg and the uh, Department of Geoinformatics. And my work normally is dealing with uh, spatial data and spatially remote sensing. And um, I use in general um, all this uh, OSGeo software that has been introduced, but in the way that Roger uh, very succinctly uh, explained, I really use it all through R. So, um, all that was behind the line uh, was uh, actually something that I know is there, but I usually try to do things through R. And in the bottom line, what I do very often is uh, creating visualizations and um, in general as well for um, my papers. 
So that's why I became very uh, fond of doing spatial data visualization with R. And what I like the most about it is that it's reproducible and easy to just go through it again and again. So if I have to review a paper, I can just um, change tweaks here and there and it will be done really fast. So I'm just gonna show you in this small presentation how I do it in a way of succinctly going in a circle into uh, what Paolo already showed, all the capabilities that R has for spatial data visualization, but just on a very specific level of uh, how I do it and what packages I use. Um, so how do we do it? Um, I'm just gonna show you three simple steps and a menu of packages that you can choose from. Um, just uh, a, a minor thing, every uh, slide that you'll see afterwards will have code to reproduce uh, each of the figures. So when I share these uh, slides, you can uh, take a look at that code. So step one will be get some data. Um, there are a lot of packages. Uh, Our Natural Earth uh, is, a, is a very basic one to get uh, outlines of countries. Uh, if you're living in the US, you can use TIGIS. And if you're living in Brazil, you can use uh, GOBR. And if you're living somewhere else, you can probably build your own package to provide data, spatial data about your country to uh, people who need it and who can uh, easily access it. Um, but my go-to favorite is to use OSM data because usually um, data is not really available for every, every place or everything that I need to um, map. And OSM data has been really my, sa uh, my savior because it's a really easy interface with the Overpass API to just get fetch some data into R and just get to work really easy. And of course, um, we are uh, geo people, so you will have your own data as well. So bring that in. And in step two, um, you bring it into R with um, different binders that you can read in and read out vector or raster data. Um, in general, there's a myriad of packages. I really like hex logos. So this is a nudge to Etzer so that I'm missing a star's hex logo um, to complete my collection. Um, but we have SF, we have stars, we have Terra, which is a successor, successor of raster, as was mentioned before. And many other ways to bring data into R, but if you're just starting, uh, this would be some of the easiest ways. And step three is just map it. And this is the really nice thing about R is that you can do this in very different ways. And the first way is to do it statically. Um, you can work with ggplot, tmap, or mapzf. ggplot uh, is uh, from the tidyverse and it's amazing in capabilities of what you can do, what you can create uh, with ggplot. And, and ggspatial is a package that allows you to also give some more spatial components like scales and north arrows, uh, etc. And they have tmap, which is one of my favorites to do any type of uh, maps in, um, in R, um, which allows you to have a thematics map uh, of anything that you want, raster or vector data. And MapSF, which is actually new in the mix, and we will have a presentation about it later on this uh, session. Um, and of course, I have to include here Base R because Base R has been really helpful to me in cases where um, I have trouble with combining raster and vector data, and Base R has been uh, useful to plotting things on top of each other without having any issues. So. Uh, it is always important to keep in mind that base R can also do fancy uh, types of visualizations. And uh, it's not only static maps that we're talking about, but also interactive. And here again, uh, we have two important packages, tmap and mapview. Uh, tmap was mentioned before, and this is the nice thing about tmap is that you can just really use it for both. So to have an interactive map and to have a um, static map, uh, you have several others like map deck, leaflet, ratiator. And I'm sure you saw on Paula's uh, presentation a um, really big exposition of all these maps and um, capabilities that you can do, including combining it with uh, shiny apps, like for example, with leaflet and, and different other packages. But what here I just want to do is to give you two resources to get you started, and there are many more. There's a lot of information out there where you can 
get tutorials on how to get you started, how to map, how to um, make something from scratch and just make it in one, two, three, two lines of code, you will have a map. Um, we have geocomputation with R from Robin Lovelace and Jacob Novosad. And we have a drawing beautiful mouse with R, SF, and ggplot part one, two, and three, which is on the R spatial blog. But as I said, there are many more. And the one thing that I wanted to show today is uh, a bonus on get inspired. So uh, Paolo already mentioned the R spatial tag on Twitter. Um, but I would like to point you out to two other tags, uh, Tidy Tuesday and 30 Day Map Challenge. And they're amazing to just get an idea of what you can do and also to challenge yourself into just start plotting something with R and, and getting your imagination up and open. Um, it is often said, and this is interesting because in Tidy Tuesday especially, um, it's a challenge that makes people do visualizations um, with a with a data set that is set up sent out every Monday and then on Tuesday the person the person has to do uh, a plot and just present it and uh, it can be about anything but it is quite often spatial well not quite often but sometimes spatial and people struggle with it but it is interesting to see how people still manage so for example here you see. Uh, Catherine Williams says this is the first time she's doing spatial analysis for Tidy Tuesday. And she comes up with a beautiful map that she can share and that she did for the challenge. She challenged herself to do this. And the beauty of this challenge is that you always um, share the code that you use to create it. And you can always get feedback and you can always get um, more um, support or other people can uh, reach out and, and get your code. So for example, you see it here. Um, this was done a map uh, for Tidy Tuesday uh, by Juliana Calabres. And then uh, Chan uh, was able to do his first time a map in R because she's, she shared the code and he could reproduce it. So that's the beauty of this, that you can really take in this um, information from other people and really get inspired. So um, one of my favorite people to share to follow on this is Cedric Scherer. He has really impressive skills of how to put data visualization together and he can do really interesting stuff with with our spatial um, and it's all about the details that you can get in this in the code that will be interesting also to just put in your own maps and in your own plots that you're doing um, tyler morgan wall is also an amazing developer of ray shader and really incredible um person to to look at for uh, data visualization, mainly 3D data visualization. Uh, so this is one of his latest work. And again, you can have the code uh, up and ready. And finally, I mean, if you have all these uh, amazing skills, you can even get uh, featured on uh, the newspaper, for example, like Dominique Raye had his uh, map made in R of um, uh, urban growth, and it was used to uh, explain heat islands in Bilbao by the newspaper. So who knows? And just share and dare to challenge yourself and also explore a bit. And maybe you can um, also get something there on the news. So um, that's it for me. And I hope this uh, helped you get a little bit inspired and um, try to just play a little bit around with what you can do with R and uh, spatial data visualization. So thank you very much. And if you have any desire to contact me, just do so. Good. Thank you so much, Lorena, for the amazing talk uh, and, and the great examples. Um, <laughs> if you have questions or if you don't want to get directly in touch with Lorena, but have questions, then, po then post them in the question uh, box because we now essentially have uh, a lot of time for uh, questions, sort of time up to the next uh, uh, talk, which is uh, almost 40 minutes um, to discuss issues. And there are a couple of good questions. So they can be questions simply about these, uh, about the presentations that you saw or other things that you have on your mind about R or R spatial or connection between R and phosphor G or R and OSTO and so on. So, um, uh, let me just look at the uh, questions and um, there is this thing with uh, with the upvotes so i will start with the question that that people have upvoted most uh, this is a very nice one 
Uh, how do you see the sustainability of our spatial in the next five years? So who can I give the floor from uh, from the panel to uh, to address that uh, that question? I was I was going to say that I would love to hear Roger's perspective on that because he's been uh, maintaining this for the longest. I, I, I've only been involved for five years, so I have no idea what the next five will look like. Yeah, that's a good point, Roger. Give us give us a, a, a view for, from history. Uh, the sustainability of our spatial 18 years ago, we just didn't know. And I think the situation now is more or less the same. However, R itself was only five years old. So perhaps uh, we can say that the R environment will be around. The use of R for spatial things has become quite central and it's used in teaching it's used in 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 lots of organizations and businesses it's used in lots of research so the the feeling that we've certainly had for the last 10 years has been that we need to keep things going so i remember when we we did the second edition of our book which was five years after the first one the first book came out in 2008 and then we were really happy to see about 12 or 15 packages using the structures that we created. Uh, we're now at a thousand. Um, I think that's enough. I don't, I, I don't think we need too many more than that. So we need to remove some of the ones which have become older and, and less use, yeah. used. So, the, so. The, the, so I think what we'll see is, is not, is not um, sustainability, but we're going to see changes in the choices which people make. Yeah. So the um, the uh, if I can comment on that. So one of the uh, I, I think one of the differences from the R community with with other communities is that there are that are incredibly many packages and that that uh, in almost all of these packages are dominantly written by a single person. There may be a list long list of contributors and they have contributed and discussed and so on. But most of the most of the work is typically done by by one person or, or some of a large component or something like that. So you would think of there's you know a, a, a strong bus factor that that this could collapse if somebody would would stop doing this or or you know or, or, or get an accident. Um, but on the other hand, because there are so many packages, you get some kind of a you know some kind of resilience. I would say that that other things you know other people also understand they can do things there are many there are there's also a lot of competition that a lot of alternatives for good ideas and people trying things out and and so if, if something would happen then then you could go on with with doing other you know solving the problems in a in a different way uh, in that sense so I'm, I'm, I'm in that sense relatively optimistic that we don't have um you know too many skills uh, um, bundled in a single person or something like that. That is one aspect. Another aspect is a, a typical, a, a sort of a, a characteristic of, of a lot of sort of stronger R developers is that that they are that they have jobs where they don't have to fight for funding to do their things. Yeah. So like Roger and, and me, we are university professors, so we are in the luxury that nobody tells us what to do really. Yeah. So if we th if we think this is important or relevant to do, uh, because I think this is research, then this is my research. Yeah. So that people sometimes ask me, how do you do this? But I just do this. You know, this is my job, so to speak. At not all, I mean, not continuously, but that gives it also. Uh, there is there. You know, there's relatively little risk that that industry will buy me out or or something like that or, or that those kind of things and, and also with many other people's people uh, look at people in our core for instance doing the sort of the development of r itself um are for a lot to a large extent uh, not not people sort of bound by, by by industry or hierarchies that tell them to do different things um right do does anyone yeah what is your what are paula or lorena what do we what is your perspective on this well i think that uh, as we have said that there are many people working with r for spatial applications and i think like the number of packages and the number of fun the functionality will will be growing in the future 
Mm -hmm. um, and it's possible that maybe there is one package that is uh, widely used and the main maintainer cannot continue with that. But if that happens, someone else will come in because it's like there are a lot of people working with the same package and, and I think and like there will be a lot of interest in, in continuing maintaining the package. Yeah, I think so too. If it's if it's relevant, if a lot of people need it, then somebody will step up and, and do things and help. Um, right. Good. Nice question. Um, so if you know if there are follow up questions on this, then please post them in the uh, in the questions box. Um, the second question we have with two upvotes is are there efforts to supply binary packages for elements like GDAL on Linux? Sometimes installing R packages on Linux can be challenging because of missing libraries at the OS level. Yes, tell me. <laughs> right. I think there is some news on this respect. Are you familiar with this Dewey maybe? Uh, well, I mean, I'm uh, I, like linking to the system is definitely like not always an option. But mostly, it's not a problem because uh, the binaries distributed by CRAN are on Windows statically linked, so you can have everything there. And on Mac, it's statically linked, so you have everything there. Um, and so lar largely, it's not a problem. On Linux, I think a lot of people get around it by container, using a container, a, a Docker or some other kind of container. Um, I've certainly done my best uh, to try to try. And like I've had a lot of fun learning about Proj by trying to build it as a binary R package. And I've had a lot of fun uh, successfully doing GEOS. I haven't successfully gotten Proj yet. Uh, I'm still working on Solaris, but uh, but GEOS, GEOS is okay. Uh, it seems to work. And um, yeah, I, it's certainly an alternative. And like, you know, I don't think that it's the future or the best way to do it, but I think it is nice to have that alternative uh, for the people that can't get it to work. You know, we're, we're all trying to write software that works on everybody's computer and uh, yeah. as especially Roger said it really nicely, like R is really good for that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they make it they make a point of making that a goal is to to make sure that it works on everyone's computer. There was there was this question, I think yesterday or something somebody was working on an R Studio Cloud instance and couldn't install S2 because there was a new version not and that the case there was there was there was not yet a binary version available. So I, I started, there was a free plan on our studio and, and I started one of these things, instances, and it installed all the packages, like I said, like zit, 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 our binary. I don't know whether it did static linking or not. I think I think not because it is in an environment, they know how it looks like, right? They know what the what the binary pack, what the libraries will be probably. Um, yeah, it definitely needs a system a system installation of uh, of something. But S two is the reason it failed is because S two is massive, and so like the, the S, it's great that it works on everyone's computer and, and anyone can install it even on Linux without any system uh, any hard to get system uh, requirements. But it also fails, you know, like you said, it fails on our Studio Cloud. So I think that's why uh, I, I don't think that's the the answer is to shove it all in an R package. But also shoving it all in our package might be a good option to have. Uh, anyway, that's my take on it. Yeah. But there are definitely, um, I think there are already competing approaches underway. Uh, there are the Ubuntu packages, our cron, that start with our cron something. And there are, there is the, the initiatives from Dirk Edelbuttel, I think. And there is these uh, uh, RPM Fedora binary packages for our packages including our spatial packages. So there are several uh, packet, our packages already binary distributed over cron, uh, uh, sorry, not over cron, but over um, net Linux networks somehow. Roger? Uh, S2107 is available on COP. So that's in Yaki's site. Ah, okay, look at that. That's so the, the, but, but yeah. what, what, what Zach does and what Inyaki do, that, that they're watching to see when a new source package is released, and they then suck it down, find the external dependencies, and build it. Now, if you look at the Debian site, then it lists the dependencies which are, which are required, so that if you install the R package, say, for SF, it will then download Google and Proj and Geos 
the versions which we used in Debian, in that version of Debian uh, to build it. Okay. And if one of those gets updated, then the R package should also get updated. But I don't think terribly many of the people who meet the problems have looked at the, uh, at the alternatives. Of course, my position is always that installing from source is, um, is the way to solve things, but not everybody feels uh, comfortable about wasting time like that. There is another question that has two upvotes, and that is this one. Can you make QGIS map layout print with QGIS process already today, or could it be in the future? That's a great question. And uh, why don't you have, you have one other question while I try it? Uh, and uh, and I'll, I'll see if we can come back to that question. Good. Yeah. Um, here is another question with two upvotes. I have the feeling that some people doing maps in R lack background on cartography and projections more than QGIS users. Some people construct maps as standard ggplot plots. For example, in Tidy Tuesdays, do you agree? If so, if so, what to do to help our users on this? It's a question to Lorena. Um, yes, uh, I totally agree. And it's really a very important remark um, because um, I've seen it happening a lot um, that people are not aware of projections. And as Edzer was uh, explaining in his keynote months ago, it's uh, really a pain <laughs> and uh, something that you people really need to wrap their hands, uh, heads around. And I think uh, what we can do about it and what how we can help is just really reaching out and just uh, trying to um, also comment on what they do. So don't leave people uh, just hanging there and just thinking that what they're doing are good. Comment on their contributions because that's what they're putting them out there so that they can get feedback and that they can get better. And that's really uh, the whole point of the challenge and the whole point of, of sharing the code. You can um, comment on the on the GitHub or you can comment on, on Twitter and just say, hey, um, why don't you consider doing it like this? Or maybe using SF instead of SP or map uh, packages or um, these kind of things that can also let people get more familiar with our spatial ecosystem and then slowly also gather more people into the, our spatial community. So, yeah. Good. Thanks. So, um, yeah. Um, and, and what I mentioned also in the keynote is uh, in, in on the it was on the USR conference this year uh, that we're thinking about uh, choosing better defaults for projections. So if you if you do a map and the, the data are in ellipsoidal coordinates, Right now, it's 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 plot carré or rectangular, equirectangular. Uh, there are of course better options. Like if it's a global map, you use, you use equal earth. If it is a regional continental map that you maybe use or the graphic or something like that, or any you know, a lot of things are better too. So that is that we're we're thinking about it. Yes, but it's it's a good point. Yes, and indeed, there's a lot of people coming from data science into R and using R spatial, and they had they like any sort of any awareness of that you know what a projection is and so on uh, that is quite difficult um there is another question what is the best way of supporting our spatial financially um any any does anyone of you need financial support so i mean yeah. I'm, I'm i'm just so i'm just so fortunate that that there are so many people uh, companies and universities that are willing to let their employees do this for work um you know fisheries notions canada is really great about supporting me when i uh fix something in sf usually something very small or work on s2 to keep sf on cran as it happened a couple of days ago uh, and yeah and I'm, I'm really fortunate that that people are willing to contribute in that way um so that's that's certainly one way if you're a company that, that you can let your employees contribute. Yeah, that's a very good answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that 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 uh, funding funding has not been the biggest problem in in R so far. Roger, there are two other mechanisms. If if you're if you're a larger company, then the R consortium is one way of helping. But that's for larger companies. For smaller groups, it's possible to make individual donations to the R Foundation uh, through um, the, the 
the R website, the, the www.r-project.org, and then there's a place where one can make a small donation. That that's also possible. Uh, the money which goes through the R Foundation has largely been used recently for funding the archive network, which is needed. The last uh, larger purchases, and it's not a lot of money, but, but buying two um, uh, Apple Silicon uh, machines. Yeah. To, that, is not, to, that is not our spatial particular, indeed. It's not uh, our spatial particular, but, but because we need the resources that they have, then, mm -hmm. then that's, the, that, that's the way it works. Yeah, uh, our spatial right. doesn't have any any uh, specific mechanism within that. But I'd agree with with Dewey that that the fact that our employers let us do what we do. Ed says, I mean, you may may have been head of department. I was told that uh, spatial stuff is is irrelevant, and the fact that lots of people come from other institutions to my classes is is not interesting. I, so so li life can be a little tougher than that. Yep. Uh, however, the, we, we do what we do, and, and I think uh, that probably reflects most of what goes on in R itself. We do publications, we do research, but in particular, those of us who work in academia teach, and we use the software that we write to teach with. So yeah. the argument for spending time on that is, is to do with, with teaching. If you nevertheless uh, insist on supporting individuals, then you can check whether they have their GitHub sponsoring program open. Or you can approach them and say, hey, I would like to sponsor your work. Um, could you make this easier for me? Something like that. There are ways of doing that. Um, so you're muted, uh, Roger. Oh, sorry, I was looking at the wrong. I was looking at the wrong screen where you were one minute. Okay. Yes, yes, sorry yes, 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 yes. Um, good. So um, another question with one upvote. What can projects like GrassGIS do to minimize maintenance or code base of packages like rgrass 7? OK, so the, that's probably me, because I'm the maintainer of rgrass 7. Mm -hmm. And I wrote recently on an issue that it would be really nice if somebody uh, took it over, adop adopted it. Um, because as Ed so mentioned, then we're already thinning my maintenance responsibilities from a, 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 a number of packages to, to remove the ones which are older. Uh, and Agra 7 uh, probably needs attention. It's possible that um, the route would be to go through QGIS that's possible, but the, the link directly to grass has been around for, for a long time. And uh, there's a good deal of research which has been done on that. So that um, um, I don't know what the answer to that is, and I don't think anybody does. But we probably need some more ac active people in, in to, to, particularly with grass 8 being released uh, in the near future, then it will be useful to have some other people on board. Good. Um, right. We have three remaining questions that I can see at least. Uh, one is which our spatial packages are applying to be OS, an OSTO project. Um, I think that was the um, those on our space on the our spatial uh, our spatial GitHub side from from Robert, so Terra and Raster as well as our hyphen spatial GitHub organization, which are the sort of the SF, STARS, MapView, S2 uh, family, sort of a, a two GitHub organizations that contain a number of them. And that is not meant to be exclusive in some way, but it happened to be kind of the, the group that was uh, sitting around and, and with it, it's not, it's not be to be, uh, you know, it's going to be inclusive. Right, so any anyone else that wants to be part of that, it's more like you know here are a bunch of packages that lots of people use, uh, and and these people support this idea of uh, of starting an OSTO uh, community project. Um, that was it. Um, have there been okay? Here is one. Have there been any efforts to promote our spatial approaches to local and state government staff in the U.S.? who largely use ArcGIS 
almost exclusively for their work. RTIS, what is? Um, who, who can I give that question to? Are you already closest to the US, do we? Maybe. I mean, yeah, no, you're on that side of the ocean uh, for, from our. Yeah, from yeah. I'm on the right <laughs> half of the Americas, I guess, to answer this question. And I, I, I do come and I have a lot of friends that work in, in various governments and I work with them for my environmental research. Uh, I can speak uh, to the Canadian side a little bit. There's certainly a lot of ArcGIS usage in the Canadian government. Um, there's also a ton of R spatial uh, and R usage. Um, there's so, so, so much. And a lot of people are switching over their automated workflows to work uh, via R because they work in ArcGIS and they work in R. Uh, and so it's a very natural switch for them to do it in that direction. Um, the people that are working in Python, sometimes they are still using Arc, but working with Arc and Python. Um, but yeah, I, I know a lot of people that are uh, migrating some of their old workflows to as they the workflows get newer um they're using r there's certainly no barrier to using r uh, in the environments uh, the it environments that we're working in which can be restrictive at times and i know that it's very similar in the states where sometimes there are some restrictive it environments um but uh, for whatever reason in the last 10 years i mean for very good reasons uh, r has won that battle and so now that r is available and our packages are available um, the rest for facial, uh, you know, largely thanks to the uh, the Crane team and Roger and Edzer and, and the people that are making sure that those libraries work. Um, it's largely seamless to do that kind of work. Um, so there, a lot of the barriers have been removed, whereas using it in Python is actually a bit difficult in our IT environment. Um, and so that's something that has been really great uh, for us uh, at the government is the ability to do work. Uh, and certainly we get all sorts of support from management because of the cost saving measure in a lot of cases. Um, and it's certainly one of the reasons uh, that I use to justify my time working on this stuff um, is because it is so, so incredibly expensive to use uh, ARC, especially in a large IT environment. Um, so yeah, it's uh, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but uh, uh, that's definitely what the environment looks like in terms of our spatial and larger organizations uh, and how easy it is to, to make that work. Mm -hmm. Roger, go ahead. Uh, but please don't forget the R ArcGIS bridge, which is supported by ESRI, is open source, which they provide. Uh, we've also had uh, uh, contacts over a number of years uh, about the R ArcGIS bridge. The idea was to allow one to script uh, ArcGIS a bit in the same way as scripting ArcGIS with Python, but to script it from, from R. And although the modules haven't matured as much as the Python modules, they are there. Uh, ESRI is uh, a, a member of the R consortium, so that they are, they are present there. Um, I'll, uh, that's really great to pass on to the people that work in our organization, because I know a lot of them, uh, if they are aware of it, aren't using it. Uh, and uh, a lot of them are using both and absolutely should. That's a good point. Okay. Um, Lorena or Paula, do you, did you come across cases where people were considering one or the other? Well, well from my experience, like I, I, I have from, I have, I have a background in statistics and I work in a university. So I, I have always used R. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that I have never had the need to work with ArcGIS. Maybe like when I was starting like 10 years ago, I did my spatial analysis and then I needed to show the outputs with, uh, with pretty maps and maybe the maps with R were very simple and very basic. But nowadays, as Lorena said, we, we have a lot of packages to do very cool maps. So uh, like, like in my experience, I, I have never had to use these, these tools, but it's true that when we collaborate with, um, for example, in my, in my field with public health officials, and we do, we, we got great tools with shiny apps, with flex dashboards, and they really appreciate how useful these tools are. And yes, they are free and they are uh, very good to share. So, okay. Um, yeah. So in my case, for example, um, 
I've been using R I started using RGS in university in the end because that's the way I was taught cartography in Ecuador. So we had an RGS um, license <laughs> to work with, and um, that's how I learned. Um, as I grew on, I started learning other uh, other ways of of uh, doing my spatial data, but I didn't really come into acquaintance with our spatial until actually uh, going completely full in the masters uh, with you, Edzer. And um, this was an interesting switch. And I am now, um, uh, since then, I started really doing everything in our spatial. And now I'm a little bit in this um, situation where all my co-workers actually work with ArcGIS um, because it's the software that we have. Uh, at the University of Salzburg, we have the UniJS, which is uh, heavily supported also by Esri, and we have um, licenses for the students to learn ArcGIS. Um, but I do see uh, slowly that there is a broader view of not only teaching ArcGIS, but also teaching QGIS, which is a, a easier process to pass from one um, commercial product to a non-commercial product that's still staying in this same environment and slowly as well teaching more Python and our spatial in different uh, ways. So it is indeed a process of uh, switching slowly and um, I see it as a necessity because, for example, in this UniJS case, I see people do have these student licenses and they learn all these things uh, for, for their work that will be useful for them. But once their master's is over, they will not have these licenses anymore. So switching into OSGEO and um, other type of uh, workflows is incredibly important for them to just keep working with what they do and keep doing good things with your spatial. So I think it's always good uh, to have in mind that this is um, a requirement to just learn to use OSGEO and just keep it forward. Yeah. OK, cool. Thank you. Um... There is one quest last question that I think we addressed. What about OSDO for Windows? Are our packages there or plans to include our spatial there? I think you addressed that, Roger, right? Briefly. Yes, I mentioned it. There was a, a period uh, about 15 years ago when Mike Sumner wanted to try to build uh, uh, or install our Google using OSGO uh, for Windows. And at Lausanne, we also talked about this. Um, we never really uh, reached a, a clear position on it. Um, one of the reasons being that um, at the time, uh, R was not being built with SIGWIN, but with MSYS for 32-bit windows. And the, the, the systems didn't really work very well together. So the, the binaries which were generated didn't really integrate very well. That's and still the case, right? This, I believe that this is still the case, but I'm not yeah. sure because uh, OS, uh, OSGO for Windows also has a, a new edition coming out now. Okay. So that uh, for our group, I think it would be important to look at this. On the other hand, if OSGO for Windows is distributing uh, dynamically linked uh, objects rather than static linked, then this doesn't mesh very well with, with the archive network for our packages. So, so that then we would need to set up a, a separate stream which static built our packages but using OSGeo, uh, OSGeo for, for, for Windows binaries rather than using self-built uh, um, uh, MSYS2 binaries, 64-bit uh, Windows uh, binaries. So I don't think we know what the, what the situation is, but mm -hmm. the early experience was that it was just as easy to roll our own. Good. So, um, so we are through with the uh, with the uh, questions from the question board. Um, we have a few minutes left, five minutes at least. So we could continue with those that we sort of prepared. We posted on the on the program. Um, where the first one is a broad one. What is ours niche within the wider Phosphor-G community? Does anyone have a view on that? Uh, well, I think Roger spoke to that uh, quite nicely uh, in talking about certainly all of the stuff that he's found. 
um, that is a miss because we we're sort of we're users of 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 OSGO, um, but we're like you know heavy users of it, and we care about all the corner cases because we're trying to pass on our our stuff, like stuff that came in through the R user, um, you know, to OSGO in a way that makes sense to OSGO. And uh, so a lot of times we have all those crazy corner cases uh, that somebody had a blank thing for for plus prod equals. Uh, we we get a lot of those uh, use cases, and so that is, um, yeah, I, I think that we're a really annoying users that care about the corner cases. Um, but I really love all of my really annoying users that care about my corner cases because they uh, they open issues and stuff that I didn't think of uh, when I was writing it because I just typed the obvious stuff, um, you know, the, the tested the the normal stuff. Um, and that was certainly the case with when we were trying S2, which wasn't necessarily a uh, uh, an OSGO thing, because uh, S2 isn't necessarily OSGO. But um, yeah, we got all the corner cases when we reversed when Edzer reverse dependency checked SF 1.0. And uh, so yeah, uh, I, I think that I think that it's really useful. Although I can't uh, speak to whether all the, the that's appreciated on the other end. Yeah. That was an interesting effort, yeah. But that is more about that in uh, in an hour when uh, when Dewey will continue talking about S two and S two geometry. Um, good. Um, anyone else wants to comment on it? I think indeed Roger did that in his talk. Um, right. How can our spatial uh, how can our spatial be better integrated in Phosphor G? Uh, besides doing panels like this. What else? What could we do more? Is there any? Oh, here is another. Ah, here's another. This is a mean question that came up in the question board. So nobody, nobody wants to have to bite on this one. Here's another sort of this, this, this question. Are you jealous of any of Python's spatial functionality? Somehow this is always Python people starting about this about this crazy Python R thing. Roger, are you jealous? Uh, not at all. Uh, the, if you look at the, the implementation in Cython of the interface with Proj, it's possible to learn a great deal. So that, that my first attempt to adapt to barn raising in Google uh, through Proj of learning about pipelines was working out from the C code in PyProj which functions in the Proj library they were the C functions they were using um, well now C plus plus but the 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 C interface so that the symbio symbiosis uh, I, I I all of our code is open source they can read our code we can read um. To, I'd love to have our uh, be able to interface in that way, and uh, you know, there's also some ways that Python is able to interface with C++ libraries. Um, you know, they're often built via Swig, and I know you can do sort of do that with R, um, but you can, you know, it's, Python is sort of object oriented by design, whereas uh, R is sort of not really by design. And perhaps uh, somebody could argue that point with me, but. Um, but Python users, uh, maybe is a better way to say it, Python users can expect to interact with objects in that way. And uh, so it's a lot of times a little bit easier to, to write wrapping libraries, um, mm -hmm. whereas R works really well to wrap C libraries. And that is, isn't always available. Uh, my pet peeve there is S2, which is the one that I'll talk about uh, in a bit. Mm -hmm. um Maybe I can add. Uh, also, I've been recently, um, and I agree with Dewey, is this um, Python connection with other um, APIs. So, for example, now I need to work with Sentinel One data, and there is the Snap uh, software that has a Python API. Or um, if you want to seamlessly download Planet data, there is a Python API um, developed for it. So it's usually um, Python uh, the go-to for uh, wrapping these APIs around. Um, which sometimes uh, I think, okay, it's of course good to know both. I think uh, working in synergy is good, but in a way I think, okay, if a lot of people working with Sentinel-1, for example, need to learn Python to use the API to use Snap, then probably they will use Python for their geospatial analysis altogether. Um, so in this way, it's a bit of, um, maybe we can also as our 
and developers try to build APIs or make it a bit more victus into that, um, R can also be a good um, um, bridge between all this um, software that is out there and spatial analysis. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, Roger. We are, uh, Fiero is very strict on time. It was an exciting, uh, exciting item. I think we can uh, talk about 15 minutes longer about it last question, but it would some, be somewhat off, to uh, off topic, I think. Um, but, but interesting, nevertheless. Um, so I just want to thank everyone, all the panel speakers here uh, this, uh, this afternoon, and, and also Vero and Priscilla from the organization to, to make this possible and um, get in touch with one of us or with others from the community and get in touch if you have questions and, and want to discuss things. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you guys. It was a pleasure to have you with us in Phosphor G and welcome also to our community. It's